Today I want to share with you 10 ways to transition from processed foods to traditional foods. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Well, I have heard from so many of you that when you begin your journey to transition from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen, you can feel very overwhelmed. You've told me that you feel you need to rush out and buy everything that you need and it often busts your budget and then you try to make everything at once and you try to be perfect and eventually it's just way too much for you to handle and you throw in the towel and I understand completely and that's why I'm here to help you. The first thing I want to say is do not feel overwhelmed because you don't need to do everything right away. And the last thing I want you to do is rush out and buy things that are out of your budget. Never feel you need to be perfect. As I've shared with you, this is a journey and you want to take this journey little by little, implementing the making of traditional foods little by little. And this journey can take a year or more. But the good thing about taking your time is that you get comfortable making these traditional foods and you get better and better at making them. And as you transition more on your journey to creating a traditional foods kitchen, you are able to move monies around in your grocery budget because you're buying less processed foods that are often more expensive. And you can move some of that grocery money to improving the quality of the real foods, the whole foods that you buy. So you can buy better vegetables, better fruits, better meats, preferably grass-fed. Possibly you're able to find raw milk in the state where you live or in the country where you live, wherever, whatever the case may be. And so taking your time on this journey is very important. And to help you on your journey, I've created this chart that you can print out at my website and there's no email required. I make it very easy for you to do. And I'll put a link in the description below that'll take you right to where you can print this out. Now we're going to go through this chart because I've got 10 ways here that is going to help you make this transition relatively easy from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen without having you feel overwhelmed. What I've done here is create 10 categories and then over here, I've got week one, week two, week three, and week four. I also have a total column. That's just to uh, allow you to kind of add things up at the end of the month to see how you're doing. But what you're going to do is you're going to go through these categories and you're going to pick two to three a week that look interesting to you that you'd like to try to make. And if making two or three of these things in one week is too much for you, don't worry about it. Then just pick one. Now all of these categories are clickable and they'll take you over to the recipe to make whatever traditional food you decide on. And then once you make it and you're in week one, you just put a check there. And then at the end of the week, you'll see how many things you've tried. And then in week two, you can try some of those same things again, or you can make something different, or you can make some of the same things and then add more things, so on and so forth. But the point is to not feel overwhelmed and to just work through these categories little by little. Maybe at the end of the month, you will have tried one of the things in, in all 10 categories. And then hopefully at the end of the month, when you can see everything that you've checked off, you can start feeling successful in your journey to transition to a traditional foods kitchen without feeling overwhelmed. You feel you have a roadmap. You've got some organization in front of you now. And basically in these 10 categories, what I've listed is the first category is roasting a chicken. You know, I always tell you that when you don't know what to do, just start with a roast chicken. And then also in that category is bone broth because that kind of goes hand in hand with roasting the chicken uh, because you can save the carcass and use that to make your bone broth. And then also in that category is soup made with bone broth. 
So that's one, those you have three options within that one category to pick. Uh, because you may be a little, you might be using this chart where you're a little farther along on your traditional foods journey. And so maybe you have bone broth already made, uh, but you've never really used it to make soup with. Uh, so that gives you some suggestion as to what you might like to do. And then as you move down the different categories, I basically just cover the various traditional foods that uh, we've been working on making over the last couple of years uh, here on the channel. And I've got uh, soaking and sprouting beans. I've got different cereals like soaked oatmeal. I've got soaked nuts on the, on the list. We've got cultured dairy. We've got ferments, sourdough starter and sourdough bread, various fermented beverages, homemade vinegars, and then sprouting flour and baking with sprouted flour. So there are a lot of different categories to pick from. Now, you don't have to have all 10 picked, say, by the end of the month. You can certainly repeat this uh, over the next few months, over your entire journey, and you can watch your success as you improve from month to month. And then there may be some categories that you eliminate. You know, again, as I've discussed in previous videos about traditional foods and about creating the traditional foods kitchen, it can mean a little something different to everyone. For example, if you don't eat dairy, you may not be culturing dairy. You may not be making homemade yogurt, a homemade milk kefir or kefir, depending on how you pronounce it. So that would be a category that you would simply eliminate. The same with sprouted flour. That's a, something that's a little more involved, and that's why I put that down at the very bottom of the list, because that can be a little harder to make, because that involves soaking and sprouting your grain, and then drying it, and then grinding it into flour and then now you have sprouted flour, which is something that can be used often to make quick breads and muffins, things like that, and it's very digestible. And, but it's very easy to bake with because you don't have to worry about using a sourdough starter uh, to make your baked good, which can be a little more challenging, especially with your quick breads. So that's something that I put at the end for people who are interested in that and find that maybe they need to uh, bake their quick breads with sprouted flour because they are trying to improve the digestibility of it. But other people don't feel they need to do that. They're comfortable using their flour as is, their whole wheat or their spelt or their einkorn, you know, some of the ancient grains, whatever the case may be, and are comfortable baking with those and making quick breads or even making yeasted breads using uh, their flour, but not needing to sprout it. So there may be some categories that you'll eliminate and you can start to see that and you can customize this chart to make it perfect for your traditional foods kitchen. And another nice thing about this chart is that when you look at those 10 categories, it can be very helpful to you to give you a picture of the type of foods that you should be incorporating into your meals as you move closer to having, say, a full-blown traditional foods kitchen. These are the type of things that eventually over time you'll be wanting to eat on a relatively regular basis, possibly even a daily basis. And those would include things like bone broth. And if you're eating uh, beans, you would want them to be soaked. And if you want to really be enthusiastic and take it one more step to not just soak them, but to also sprout them before cooking. And different cereals. Uh, generally, I recommend that when you are eating cereals that you do soak them. And I show you how to take oat groats, the actual whole oat, and how to toast it and pulverize it just using one of those little uh, spice grinders that are very common and then soaking it overnight and then turning it into a porridge that's very digestible. And why are we talking so much about all of the soaking and maybe even sprouting? And the reason is that grains contain ingredients that protect them when they're out in nature. But once they become wet, they sprout, and that's how we have the various plants that we have. And that sprouting process deactivates 
some of those things that protect it when it's just in its seed form. The problem is those things that protect the seed when before it has a chance to sprout can be difficult for humans to digest. So by soaking and sprouting these various grains and beans, we make them easier to digest. So that, that's why I'm often talking about soaking and maybe even sprouting. And then the same goes for nuts. They also have things that protect them. And so by soaking them, we make them more digestible. And I have videos showing you how to do all of this. And they're very detailed, very step-by-step. -step. They're perfect for the beginner. And you can see here, all of them, everything that I'm talking about does have links to videos that will show you how to do this, as well as have a corresponding uh, recipe that you can print out with all the instructions you'll need and that's perfect to put in your kitchen journal. I hope you've started uh, make, creating a kitchen journal and keeping that. And eventually if you do eat dairy and you want to incorporate culture, you'll, you'll want to incorporate cultured dairy into your daily diet. And the reason is again cultured dairy is very nutritious in that it's enriched with good bacteria. And it's the good bacteria that is excellent for our gut health. And as I've shared with you many times before, good gut health is very important to our overall health. And then in the next food that you'll want to be incorporating on a daily basis will be ferments. And in the list here, I have sauerkraut first because that's a really good ferment to start with because it's a relatively easy ferment to make. But you can ferment all types of vegetables and you can even make all of your condiments like ketchup and mustard in a fermented form as well. And then the next category that you'll want to be trying to incorporate on a daily basis into your traditional foods kitchen is sourdough. And sourdough does take a little more time and effort to learn how to make, but through a little trial and error and a little, exp and a little experimentation, that's why I tell you take this one day at a time, little by little, you will become comfortable with the sourdough starter that you've created and then over time, as you uh, try making sourdough bread, each loaf is going to get a little better. Number one, your, your starter will be maturing and getting stronger and stronger, and your skills at making sourdough bread will get better and better. And then the next category, beverages. When you incorporate beverages into your meals in a traditional foods kitchen, you want to try to include beverages that are not just empty calories. You want to wean yourself off of the various processed drinks that are out there like the very sugary sodas or just a lot of plain fruit juice. This is not going to, these, those types of beverages are not going to improve your health over the long run. You're going to want to try those that are probiotic rich, again, like the ferments, like the cultured dairy. Uh, the more good bacteria that we can get into our bodies, all the better. So I talk about experimenting with making beet kvass or rye bread kvass. That's a very easy one to make. You're basically using stale rye bread. And then water kefir or kefir is very similar to milk kefir. It's simply made with water, and yet it's very rich in uh, probiotics. And then, of course, kombucha, which is so popular today, and I show you how to make that, and that is a very detailed video. And so hopefully I'll cover pretty much any question that you would have about making kombucha. And then the next category that you want to try to in in uh, include in your traditional foods kitchen, the meals that you're making in your traditional foods ki kitchen, is homemade vinegar. Because your homemade vinegar is going to contain what's referred to as the mother. And what is the mother? It's more good bacteria. <laughs> so are you seeing a theme here? <laughs> and I show you how uh, to make uh, apple cider vinegar, raw apple cider vinegar and then raw fruit scrap vinegar. There's a lot of different types of vinegars you can make, and they're relatively easy to make. And then you can use those vinegars that you make homemade that contain the mother, that are rich in probiotics, that are raw, to make your salad dressings. And so again, you're incorporating that into 
into your traditional foods meals. And then there's the last, which we already discussed, was the sprouted flour. But so these are the 10 ways that you can begin to make the transition from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen and hopefully make this transition relatively easy with this roadmap. That's basically what I think of this uh, printout as, a sort of a roadmap that you can say and look at this and say, okay, I'm gonna try two or three of these and then over time, I'm going to look at the two or three meals that, or even one meal that I make during the day and how can I try to incorporate most of these foods into the meal that I'm making. And when you get to that point, you are going to be quite far along on your traditional foods journey. Because for breakfast, you're gonna be serving things. Some things are very easy to make that are very traditional, like eggs and bacon and sourdough toast. Or maybe you're making the soaked oatmeal for breakfast and you have some fresh fruit on it and you're using maybe some maple syrup or a little sucanat, which is the natural sugar cane juice that's simply been dried but all of these foods are real foods in their natural state and so they're contributing the most to our proper nutrition and then maybe for lunch you're having a salad with fresh vegetables maybe even some that you've grown or, or purchased at the farmers market and then you're using your homemade dressing that you're making with your raw apple cider vinegar that you've made and then maybe for dinner you're going to roast the chicken and then you're going to save the carcass then you're going to make a bone broth and then the next day you're going to use that bone broth to make a bone broth soup with maybe some of the leftover chicken from your roast chicken. And so the cycle really does, be, it develops a rhythm. And the foods that you're using, uh, you'll, be, you'll be maximizing the nutrition from the foods that you're using because you're gonna be properly preparing them, making them uh, in their most digestible state for our, our bodies so that we can assimilate most of the nutrients that are available in these real foods, in these whole foods. So as you can see, there is a rhythm, there is a cycle uh, to creating a traditional foods kitchen. And you're going to find that you're going to waste less and less food because bone broth is really the backbone of the traditional foods kitchen. And you can use the bone broth to make what I affectionately call the clean out the crisper type soups. And so you can put a lot of veggies into your bone broth and serve that as a lovely soup. And they can be veggies that maybe are not 100% perfect for a salad, but in a soup, no one's going to notice that maybe they're just inching up towards their prime. And so that is a wonderful way to not waste anything, uh, any, any of your fresh foods like your vegetables. The same with ferments. You can ferment a lot of scraps and no one's going to know that they were just scraps. They're just going to think that they're sort of a lovely pickled vegetable. And the same is true for when you make kvass. Uh, you use some beets, or in the case of the rye bread, you're just using some rye bread scraps. And that's a wonderful beverage to learn how to make because you don't necessarily have to worry about having the main ingredient, so to speak, that is necessary for making the beverage, that main ingredient being something that isn't easily attainable at your grocery store. For example, to make kefir or kefir, you need the, the grains. And so you have to get those from someone or buy them. The same with kombucha. Although there are uh, some websites that'll talk about trying to make your own kombucha scoby, which is what you'll need to make kombucha, that can be a little unpredictable and is not always a perfect uh, situation. And sometimes people find they're developing a lot of molds and not necessarily good molds. So, but, so if you, but if you wanna make the, the kefir, you need the grains. If you wanna make kombucha, you need what's called the scoby. And so those can be a little more involved and something that you may want to deal with farther down on your traditional foods journey. However, kvass, like I said, you can pick up a few uh, beets from your local grocery store, 
or if you have a loaf of rye bread, um, maybe one that you've made homemade, even better, maybe even a sourdough one. And basically you toast. It's already stale. If it's hard, you're all set. If it's not hard, usually it's recommended to toast it. And then you basically put it in a jar. You can add different things for flavoring. Maybe you have an apple in your fruit bin that's looking a little past its prime or maybe you've got a little handful of dried fruit you can throw that in as you see these things are very flexible and they're very easy to make and then when the kvass is ready you have a wonderful sort of bubbly effervescent drink that has a very nice flavor to it and that makes a wonderful replacement for soda and yet it's good for you and it's rich in probiotics and I just want to mention going back to category four, soaked nuts, uh, that can really work well with your soaked oatmeal because when you soak your oatmeal at night, you can also soak your nuts. And so then the next day, you've got different types of nuts. Pecan, we love pecans here. You know, with being in Central Texas, pecans are very common. And so we'll, I'll soak the pecans at night and I'll also soak my oatmeal. I'll cook my oatmeal in the morning drain the pecans, and then put those onto the oatmeal along with some fresh fruit, and as I mentioned earlier, maybe some maple syrup or something like that. So you're going to find that many of these go hand, many of these 10 ways to transition from a processed foods kitchen to a tr traditional foods kitchen go hand in hand with one another. And then you're going to get into this rhythm, and you're going to find that this is much easier easier than you thought it was going to be. And you don't have to worry about creating a wide variety of recipes or a wide variety of foods. You can simply look at these 10 categories and say, well, okay, I've, I'm covered. I'm basically making something in one of these 10 categories, and that's going to serve me and my family, friends, whomever you're feeding very well. And as you go through the seasons, because the traditional foods kitchen also is a very seasonal kitchen. So as you're going through these 10 categories, you will also be tweaking them slightly as you go into different seasons, because you may be eating different types of foods in the summer than you would be in the winter. But that's easy because when you go through this, uh, through these 10 categories, you can say, well, I really enjoy having a lot of fermented beverages in the summer because that's when it's very hot and we want to have a lot of cool beverages to drink. And so your emphasis will be focused on those beverages. And the summertime, for example, is a great time to have your fermented condiments ready because those will be wonderful for when you have barbecues. And you may be roasting your chicken outside, maybe on one of those upright roasters, or maybe you're just doing a stovetop chicken dish. And I have so many recipes for you on my website, on my YouTube channel, walking you through these different recipes that are seasonally based, because you may not want to turn your oven on in the summer, and so you may not be roasting a chicken, but you may be doing a stovetop chicken dish, or maybe you're barbecuing hot dogs and hamburgers outside, and maybe at this point on your journey, you've transitioned to where you're buying grass-fed and grass-finished beef. So this chart will be a start for you. And then as you look at all the different playlists that are listed on my homepage, on my YouTube channel, you'll see different recipes that'll fit into different seasons, but at the same time will fit into these 10 categories. So you're going to have everything you need because I've I think at this point I've got over about 400 videos uh, with recipes, so you're all set. And keep in mind that even when it comes to baking bread, you don't necessarily have to be baking a sourdough bread in your oven if it's very warm and you don't feel like turning on the oven. You can use your sourdough starter to make a lot of things on the stovetop that are also very nutritious. And you can just keep feeding your starter and making more and more starter that you use in essence to cook with. It's a wonderful way to use your discard when you are baking, but it's also a wonderful way in the summer to get those good nutritious uh, digestible breads in essence into you without turning on your oven. You can make 
pancakes, you can make waffles, you can make uh, flatbreads, you can make uh, toppings for stovetop type casseroles that really just involve making something that if you're familiar with sort of looks like a tamale pie but instead of a corn topping you've got a sourdough topping that's basically just your sourdough starter that you've poured on top. So, and, so there are a lot of things you can do on the griddle with your sourdough starter without even turning on your oven. So you're going to find that using these 10 categories as you journey to a traditional foods kitchen is what's going to keep things calm and not overwhelming because you're just going to pick a few, check them off, and maybe even just repeat those two or three throughout the entire month without even covering all 10 categories. If you feel you need the practice, then by all means, don't rush. But this is going to help you keep track of what you've started learning and what you've started incorporating into your traditional foods meals. So I really hope that this is going to help you feel calm and efficient and be successful on your traditional foods journey. And now if you would like more information about how to master the basics of traditional foods nutrient dense cooking, be sure to click on this playlist here where I take you through bone broth all the ways to sprouted flour. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.